Amen. Now, we are in week seven of a series in which we've been going through the book of Ephesians, been having a blast doing it. Hopefully, you're part of a small group because that's how you're going to get the most out of this series, the most life transformation. I've been saying it almost every week, but but you're only getting about 30% of what you could be getting if you're just coming to church on Sunday mornings because my preaching ain't that good and you don't have that much time to actually be together on a Sunday morning. It's kind of a high and by type of deal, but if you're part of a small group, that's where real life gets to happen. It's where you guys get to share food together, share, you know, talk story and, and pray for each other. And we've got groups all over uh, Kona. We've got about 45 of them going um, that you can be a part of. And if you want more information about that, get online, check our website out. There are still a couple groups that have a few spots left. Most of them are full, um, but there are a few spots left. But I want to encourage you to do that. Now, as we've been going through this series, we've seen that Paul takes the first three chapters of this letter that he wrote to a church, a church much like ours, that was living in a culture that's much like ours here in Hawaii today. And he took the first three chapters and he said nothing about what the Ephesians were actually to do as Christians. Nothing. All he did was say, here's what you're to be as Christians. Here's what you're to believe. He said, let me lay this theological foundation, this groundwork upon which then we can talk about, here's how you live out your life as a Christian. Now, it's kind of fun because there's these three phrases in the letter, sit, walk, stand, that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, which is kind of a neat way to say, here's who we are in Christ, here's what we need to believe about God and ourselves, and then having known and received who we are, our sitting position, then we get to start walking, which is what we're going to do today. And he says, walk, this is chapter four, walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. He says, you know how you're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus? This is who you are in Jesus? Now, because you know that, I want you to walk from that identity, from that belief, from that foundation, and do it in a manner that's worthy of all that Christ has done for you. And then we'll see in the last chapter in a few weeks, he'll say, now stand, stand firm against all the attacks of the enemy. Today, we get to learn how to walk. You guys excited? It's taking us seven weeks to get here. I'm excited. Paul says, we get to walk now and learn how to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we have been given. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 11. And let's see what he says. He says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Different sermon, but this is my job description right here. Who does the work? Who equips you? Me, in part along with the other pastors and leaders here at the church. Our job is just to give you tools to to help you, to encourage you, and say, go do the work of ministry. Different sermon, but a fun one. This will continue, Paul says, until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord. Everyone say mature. Mature. Okay, now remember, you got to remember what Paul's already laid out. You know, we talked about the dividing walls, how he says that there were Jews and not Jews, Right? Those that that knew and loved God, that were part of the chosen people, and those that just were completely separated from God. And he says, now in Christ, that dividing wall, gone. And there's no longer Jews or not Jews. It's the whole new human race, which is called in Christ. Now remember, just because they're in Christ does not mean that they lose their personality, does not mean that they lose their their diversity. You've got very different types of people with very different types of values and beliefs coming together under one roof, one family, the church. And he says, here's the goal, that we will continue and that we will grow in such unity, right? Different people, so different but they're coming together in unity. And here's what he says the goal is, not just unity, but that we will be mature in the Lord. Everyone say mature again. What we're going to talk about today is growing up. One of the things that Paul and that the Lord Jesus himself wants for every believer is to grow up. Turn to your neighbor and say, grow up. Right? Just feels good, doesn't it? (laughs) 
This is like those people in your life that you're just like, stop talking to me, just grow up, right? There, there's an aspect, and God's so much nicer about it than we are, but there's this aspect where Paul's looking at this very diverse group of people and it's just like, grow up. This is the goal. This is what we're working to, towards, that we would be mature in the Lord. And then he gives us the standard. How do you know when you're grown up? How do you know when you're mature? Well, he tells us, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Jesus Christ. Whoa! Here we go. I just became a lot more immature <laughs> in my own eyes. And you did too, right? Because the standard of maturity isn't, well, I read my Bible a bunch, or I did this, or I did that. The standard is Jesus Christ himself. Paul will say it like this in Romans 8, 29. He said that you have be, you've been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. That, that there is the mold that we're all trying to be shaped into, and the mold is Jesus himself. Now, here's the thing. It does not mean that you lose your personality. Did you, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but Jesus, if he took the Myers-Briggs test, he would have a certain personality. He's human in the same way that you and I are fully God, fully human. He's got most likely a different personality than you do. I like to think he's got the same one as I do, but I'm not sure about that. <laughs> he's got a personality. And just because he says that we are destined to be conformed to the image of Christ does not mean that you are to lose your distinctness or your personality. It just means that your personality is going to become the best that it possibly can be, the purest form of it, the most godly form of it. That's what maturing looks like. It's taking all the characteristics and qualities of Christ and the values of the kingdom and seeing those sift down and completely... Uh, uh, what's that word I'm looking for? Like infiltrate every part of your personality, every part of your thought process, every part of your emotions and, and feelings. This is what it means to actually grow up and to mature. Now, here's the question. How do we do it? What does it look like, at least according to Paul, in this letter to grow up? What, is it, what does he say is kind of one of the first steps as we're learning to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we've been given, what does it look like? I'm glad you asked. Let's look. It's this. He says, I'll speak the truth in love. If you are going to grow and learn to walk and to be conformed to the image of Christ, one of the first things Paul says is that you need to learn how to speak the truth, which some of you are really good at, but then you're not so good at the second part. In love, some of you are really good at the last part. Oh, I love everybody, but you're really bad at speaking the truth. And so God doesn't, you know, let us off the hook. He, he says, look, I know some of your personalities are, you know, rough, tough, gruff. I'm just going to speak the truth, but now you need to learn to do it in love. And others of you are so loving. Now you need to learn to speak the truth. He says, you will speak the truth in love. Let's look at Paul's word, verse 14. Then we will no longer be immature like children. Okay, he says the immaturity is going to pass. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies. So clever they sound like truth. I, I need you to understand this. Here's Paul saying, look, we need to protect everything that we've just set up for the first three chapters. The sitting, the right believing, the foundation. But that stuff won't stay in place unless you grow in maturity. That you stick to the truth but how are you going to stick to the truth and not be deceived? He says, we're going to speak the truth in love. Who's speaking? All of us. Yeah. You're not going to stick to the truth and not be deceived if you're only listening to my voice. This is the body of Christ together, all playing their part. He's going to say this in just a moment. All playing their part, speaking truth. Guess what? There is too much truth to be spoken that one person can handle. It's the entire body of Christ. Instead, instead, go back from me real quick. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church, maturing. Look what he says. The, isn't it interesting that the only way that I can grow 
more and more like Christ in every way is if you speak the truth in love in every way. My, I hate this because I am so fiercely independent, but my ability to be conformed to the image of Christ is dependent upon you speaking truth into my life. It can't happen without it. He goes on. He makes the whole body, that's you all, us together, fit together perfectly. I look at our church and I go, it doesn't seem like it's fitting together perfectly. (laughs) But Jesus, from his standpoint, is like, no, 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 I've put these very different people together on, Lord, are you sure about these people? I mean, there's other churches you could see, you know, whatever. No, he put them together. Not you guys, this is a 1030 service. I put them together. And he's making them all fit perfectly. I don't know if you ever thought, you know, sometimes you read these lists in scripture and you just blaze over them. Like the list of the disciples, you know, say, well, there was Simon the Zealot and there was also Matthew the tax collector. And then there was both, wait, 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 back up a second. Simon the Zealot. Do you know what that was? That was a Jew who hated the Roman government more than anything and would go to any lengths to overthrow it. He hated everyone who loved the Roman Empire, supported the Roman Empire in any way. And then Jesus like, yep, I want you. And then Jesus comes over and like, ah, oh, I want Matthew, the chief tax collector, a Jew who had sold out and committed treason against his own people to exploit his people, take advantage of his own people to support the Roman government. Can you imagine what the conversations were like around the campfire at night? Do you think maybe there was some conflict and chaos and maybe some truth telling that was going on? I mean, you can, only, you, just, you can smell the smoke and you can just see Simon getting so red in the face. How could you do that? And then Paul says, look, here's what it means to grow up and to be conformed to the image of Christ. Simon, Matthew, yeah, you both are going to be part of the club. And we're going to put you together for years and years and years so that you can speak truth, but you're going to have to learn to do it in love. It's amazing. It says, as each part does its own special work, that says you speak truth to me, I speak truth to you, you speak truth to your neighbor, to your spouse, and so on. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. We cannot be a healthy growing body that's full of love unless we learn how to speak truth. You know, there's a lot of relationships in our life that um, stay on a certain level, a very shallow level, a hey, how's it going, how you doing, great, see you later kind of level. Then there's some deeper friendships where we actually do life and we talk and we encourage each other and the, the deepness increases. But there's a certain level of friendship when when a relationship actually kind of transitions from friendship to family. And there's only one way to get from friendship to family. And you know what that is? Conflict. Truth telling. In love. You are not family unless you've actually gone through the tunnel of (laughs) truth-telling and moved from shallow relationship, friend, acquaintance, whatever you want to call it, into family. I am closest to my wife in this life, by far. Guess who I have fought with more than any other person in this world? Guess who I've had more conflict with? Guess who has spoken more truth to me than any other person in this world? And I'm learning to reciprocate. Not very good at it. I got to tell you this up front. This message is not me speaking from a place of strength. This is like the thing I'm worst at, okay? But, but there's this deepening of relationship that the Lord wants so that our body, our church family, can be healthy and growing. And it's one of these things where we have to create a culture that actually values conflict, that actually values truth-telling, that doesn't fear it that it's going to break relationship, but sees it as, as a currency, sees it as a means to actually deepen relationship 
so that we can grow closer together, so that we can mature, so that we can grow, so that we actually can become more effective in being the type of people that we need to be in order to fulfill the mission that Christ has given us. Can I get an amen? amen. And so if, if, if you're the type of person that doesn't like this, tough. You signed up to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. You know, when I was, um, this summer, we took a family vacation and we're driving through eastern Washington. And have you ever driven, uh, you know, by uh, like a, a cattle dairy, a dairy farm before? Um, you know, that's the time when you put your air conditioning on, recirculate, roll up the windows, because there's a certain aroma in the air when, when you drive by a dairy farm. And, you know, it, could you imagine what it would be like if you had a dairy farmer that was afraid of manure? You know, hey, we've done a miraculous thing. We've taught our cows to walk with their tails between their legs. They make no manure at all. This is a clean facility. Guess how much milk those cows are going to produce? None, because they're going to... Let me tell you something. The moment you gave your life to Jesus, you changed vocations. You became someone who was working in the people business. And if we're afraid of messes and conflict and if we're afraid of other people's sin and learning how to deal with it and work through those things, we're like that dairy farmer that's afraid of manure. The manure is not the problem. Right? Like, the success of that dairy farm isn't measured by how clean and how few messes there are. It's measured by how much milk is produced. And a body of Christ is, you know, its success is not measured by how few messes it has. Everyone just shows up and they're nice and they're dancing around each other and wow, an amazing body. No, it's about how fruitful we are. And I don't know if you've ever farmed before, but it takes crap to make things grow. Preach it. Amen. Preach it. You're going to create messes. And the people that you're involved with in church are going to create messes. And the people that you work with are going to create messes. And Paul says, here's one of your first steps as a believer. Learn how to speak the truth in love. This is what it means to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you begin. Learn how to speak the truth in love so that you can grow and that the people around you can grow as well. Now, typically, there's three types of communicators, you know, when it comes to, to speaking truth. And you guys are probably familiar with this, but you know, I'll put them up real quick. You know, you've got the passive type. Is it up there? There it is. You've got passive communicators, you've got aggressive communicators, and then you have my favorite, passive-aggressive communicators, right? The passives are the ones, you know, there's like, I can't, I can't speak the truth because they may not like me, or I can't speak the truth because I might hurt their feelings, or they may not feel loved, or I might discourage them, or whatever it might be, right? It, it, I, saw, I saw a great YouTube clip. It, it was another church that put it out, and it was these two guys sitting on this kind of rocky edge of a cliff and, and a third guy came walking up and they're just talking and this guy was blind and he's stumbling, al stumbling along. And they're like, hey, isn't that Dave from Econ? Oh yeah, it's Dave. What's he doing out here? I don't know, just taking a walk. Oh, okay. Isn't he blind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's walking towards the cliff. We should warn him. No, we can't warn him. We don't want to discourage him. I mean, have you ever been blind? Do you know what it's like to be blind? And it just goes on and on and on. Just hilarious. You can, you can Google it. And they're just so, they're unwilling to speak the truth. They might hurt his feelings. You're doing a great job, Dave. We're so proud of you. And then it ends with him falling off the cliff. <laughs> and they're just like, oh, looking at each other. There's these passive communicators that are so concerned with loving people that they actually don't even know what the definition of love is, and they're unwilling to speak wow. truth. Proverbs 28, 23, this isn't on the screen. It says, in the end, people appreciate frankness more than flattery. It's true. It's true. People want truth. It might hurt them, but in the end, people want to know that you're shooting straight with them. 
Then you have what I call, I didn't put this up, but you could call it passive 2.0. This is that you're kind of passive, you're unwilling to speak truth, not so much because you're worried that you're going to hurt the other person, not so much that you're, you're, you're uh, worried that they're not going to like you. It's mainly just because you're indifferent and you don't care. Honestly, this just, just gets down to selfishness. This is the category I fall into most often. There was a time, I'll tell you a story. Uh, I used to teach music lessons, and I would teach them down at the Elite You Drive uh, church site. And there was a season of about six months where every time I would be teaching music lessons, and that was about six hours a week, this little yellow bird would come, land on the windowsill, and just tap at the window. And if it didn't see me, it would fly to another window near me, and it would just tap at the window. Now, it happened once. I was like, oh, that's so weird, poor little bird. For six months, I kid you not, every time I stepped foot into that building, that little bird would come in and just tap at the window. Now, it was, finally, I wise up like, Lord, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> just tap, 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 tap. I was like, okay, I think the Lord's trying to get my attention. What's up, Lord? Nothing. A little while later, I'm in my backyard sitting, and, and I'm reading my Bible, and I'm reading a passage about friendship. And then my kids run out and they say, Dad, we found this little bird and it's hurt. It's one of those little green ones with a skinny beak. Can we nurse it back to health? Can we take care of it? And my first thought immediately was, I'm just going to go break its neck and throw it in the bushes so I don't have to deal with it. <laughs> that thought goes through my mind. And then the Lord says, that's how you view friendships. <laughs> he said, if it's too much trouble, if it's too much hassle, you'd rather just pull back and be passive. You'd rather just break off the friendship. You'd rather not speak the truth in love because you're selfish. And it was just like, oh. So I still told my kids, no, we're not taking care of this bird. But <laughs> the Lord spoke to me in that moment. It's a process, y'all. But the Lord began teaching me something. What he taught me was this. He, he taught me this. I, I wrote this down. He said, my willingness to speak truth in love demonstrates the level of value I place on a relationship. If you actually value a relationship, that value is determined by how willing you are to speak truth in love. And the Lord began to convict me. And I've been through this process of praying, Lord, change my heart, change my heart. I need to change in the way that I view these relationships. Another way that some of us uh, communicate, if you can bring that back up, would be the aggressive manner. Most of us know what that's like. You know, this is the person that's willing to speak truth. They speak their mind at all times. They're, they're you know, can often come out explosive and angry. But here's the thing that really sets uh, the aggressive person apart, is they're willing to communicate truth, but they're never concerned with whether someone receives truth. There's a huge difference. Hey, I've done my part. I've spoken the truth. Yeah, but you've spoken it in a way that nobody can receive. Way to go. When we learn to speak the truth in love, we're not only concerned with speaking the truth, but we're concerned with speaking it in a way that somebody can receive. Because our end goal is not speaking truth. It's speaking truth so in love so that somebody can receive it. The end goal is them receiving truth. Right? Right? It's like that classic, you know, you see this all the time. People out there on the streets yelling at people, turn or burn, baby! And they're saying it in a way that's, yes, speaking truth, but has no concern with whether someone's going to receive it or not. God hates fags. And you're like, what? God detests homosexuality. Is it true? The first one's not. The second one is. <laughs> but are you saying it in a way, I got your attention now. Are you saying it in a way that people can actually receive it? Yeah. God doesn't hate you. He loves you. He hates the bondage that you're in. He hates what was done to you that brought about this bondage. You see, the aggressive type, it's just about speaking truth. It, it, there's no concern for whether people are going to receive it or not. And then there's your classic passive-aggressive, right? This is the person that 
on the outside, oh, I'm fine, it's all good, you know, we're just gonna love each other. And then they'll leave the conversation and go key your car, you know? <laughs> and what Paul is saying is, look, there's a whole new way of communicating truth, and it's called speaking the truth in love. And I know for a lot of you, I feel like, I probably guarantee that as you're looking at that list, you're identifying with one of those three slash four that I listed. And and I don't want to get down on you because I would be getting down on myself and I don't like doing that. But I have the sense that for a lot of us, we're communicating truth or the lack of truth in one of these ways simply because it's the only tool we've ever known. Like I had a roommate in college, his parents... It was, a, it was a passive aggressive mixed with an aggressive. And so to survive in that household, he had to be passive the whole time. And so every time he, we had conflict, it was phew, shut down, pa- everything's fine, it was just passive. It was the only tool he, he knew how to use. And Paul's like, look, I want to open your eyes to some new tools. I remember there was one summer during college that I was a janitor at a church. I was probably 18, 19 years old. And, and I remember one day the secretary called me in and said, hey, the sink in the break room is all plugged up. Can you come unclog it? I'm like, well, I've never unclogged a sink. I've unclogged the toilet. Same, same. So I go into the bathroom and I grab the plunger that's been in the toilet and I bring it into the break room and I just start kind of making a mess there, like a big E. coli type mess, right? You know, I didn't know that there was something called liquid plumber. I didn't know what Drano was back then. I was just using the only tool that I had, that I was uh, comfortable with, that I was aware of. And some of you are doing that same thing. Well, this is all I've ever known. This is how my parents acted. This is how my teachers acted. And you're getting the plunger and you're making a mess. And Paul's like, there's a different and better way. It's called speaking the truth in love. Now, what does that look like? Thomas Aquinas had a great definition of love. He said this. He said, to love somebody means to will their good. Thomas Aquinas was one of the the early church fathers. I mean, he's just like, it's like going to Mecca, okay? To love somebody means to will their good. Now, back in this day, it was understood that to will their good meant that you weren't just going to think about it and do nothing. To will meant that you were going to think and to act and to do everything that you could to actually bring about someone else's good. When we're speaking about truth-telling and truth-telling in love, at the core of it is, look, my motivation, my desire is to bring about your good. And, and I need to speak some things that might be hard to hear for you, but, but my desire, my motivation is for your good. That's what it is to speak truth in love. And we've got this option, you know, some of us are so scared to speak truth, and instead what we do is we'll just take all these offenses, we'll just take it, we'll just take it and take it, and we'll turn on it, and it's like we create this little list of everyone that's offended, but we've never actually gone and talked to them about it. Like if my wife does something that hurts me or frustrates me, it's my responsibility as her husband to go and lovingly point it out. What does that look like? Um, Hey, babe, you remember when you said this or you did that? That really frustrated me. I love you, but it really frustrated me. This is why. Not angry, not abrasive, also not passive, but I'm giving her an opportunity to know how I'm experiencing her in that moment. Now, we don't have time. I mean, there is, oh, you need to pick the right time right? The right place, the right moment, the right attitude. There's so much that goes into this. But ultimately, what you're doing is you're giving them an opportunity to grow, and you're giving them an opportunity to clean up your mess. I mean, to clean up their mess. Like, it's not fair to people. When you don't address a frustration or hurt that you've received from somebody, again, this is all coupled with wisdom, but when you don't you're actually limiting their growth. 
It's not fair to them. It's not fair that you don't give them that opportunity to say, to know that I'm sorry. Or to say, yeah, I know I frustrated you, but here's why, whatever it might be. Is that making sense? Yeah. Okay, it's so, so important. And it sounds simple, but I think you'd be surprised if you, you know, took a minute and thought about how many people you've been frustrated with or hurt with that you've actually never gone and spoken to them about it. And part of learning to walk in a manner worthy of the calling is saying, look, okay, I'm going to take the risk, I'm going to step out, and I'm going to speak the truth in love. Now, this can be risky. When you actually speak the truth in love, sometimes you can come across unloving. Not because you're meaning to you or actually being unloving, but sometimes speaking truth feels unloving. When you're speaking the truth in love, you have to overcome the fear of being rejected by that person. Oh, I don't want to speak anything. What if they break off relationship? You also have to be prepared. And let me just say this. When you're speaking the truth in love, be ready to absorb the initial kickback. Not everyone is as spiritually mature as you are. And some people have a harder time accepting criticism than others. And, and just if you go into it with that mindset of, yeah, there's going to be initial blowback, I'm ready to absorb it for the sake of relationship and for the sake of growth, it's going to go a long way in helping you. Let me, let me show you this. 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 4, right? The classic text on what love looks like. Let's put it in the context of speaking truth, having those hard, com- hard conversations. Love's patient. Love's kind. Doesn't envy. Doesn't boast. It's not proud. Does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. You think that might be helpful in communicating truth? I think so. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. There might be that initial blowback, but you absorb it because you're willing to persevere and say, okay, let's work through whatever might come up and the initial flare up, but let's get to the truth in love. Now, here's what I want to end with. I'm going to give you two things today on what it looks like to grow mature. Number one is speak the truth in love. Paul doesn't say this, but it's implied in the context. Here's what the second thing is that we need to do if we're going to grow in maturity. I'll speak the truth in love, and then secondly, I'll receive the truth with grace and humility. You can't always be the truth teller. Sorry. Most of you learn that lesson in preschool. You know, you can't always be the person who's hiding. You've got to be the person who's it sometimes. There's going to be times when people are going to be Truth telling to you, how are you going to receive it? You need to receive it with grace and humility. What does it mean to receive truth in grace? Um, It means this. There's going to be times when people are going to speak in truth to you, and it's not going to be spoken in a way that you appreciate. There might be some anger or sarcasm, or it might come across feeling condescending, whatever it is. You may not like it, but it doesn't mean that they're not actually speaking truth to you. It doesn't mean that it's not actually the Lord trying to speak through them to you to help you grow and mature. And so Grace says, look, you may not be speaking it the way that I best receive right now, but I'm going to receive the truth in grace, and I'm going to take it anyways. Here's the other thing that it means when we receive truth in grace. 99.99999% of the time when someone's speaking truth to you, what they're saying is not going to be completely true. Or another way to say it is, there's going to be truth that's spoken, that's intermingled with things that aren't true. That they're actually going to be speaking sometimes through their own judgments of you, through their own perception of what took place. And when I receive truth and grace, it's learning how to pick and choose and say, yeah, that is true. And just because they said something that's not true doesn't negate the fact that they just spoke something that's true that I need to grab hold of, right? It's learning how to, to eat the meat and spit out the bones, so to speak, That's part of receiving truth gracefully. What does it mean to receive it with humility? That one's kind of a no-brainer, but it means you're wrong sometimes. Plain and simple. That you have to have this assumption 
and, and, and I try to operate in this. Every time someone comes and speaks to me with a criticism, I always try to operate with the assumption that I was wrong in some way. It doesn't mean that I'm not confident. It just means, hey, there's a lot of things about myself that I don't see. Like my entire backside, I never see that, right? <laughs> Half of what you know, makes me up, I never see. Which means that there's probably things that you're seeing that I'm not, which means there's like a 50-50% chance that I'm wrong in some way, shape, or form. And so humility says, I'm going to receive it with that expectation that, you know, maybe you're not fully right, but there's a good chance that there's something I've done. Like husbands, wives, this works so great for marriage. It took me like 14 years to learn, but when I'm in an argument with my wife and I know she's wrong, those are the best kind, <laughs> I've learned that even when I think I'm 100% right, there's always something wrong I'm doing. This is not, I'm not trying to be funny like she just points at, no, like really, there's some way I've been insensitive or I've communicated poor, there's always some way that I can get better in my communication or what the, thing, you know, the things that I've done. And so we receive truth in both grace and humility. What does that look like? One verse and then we'll close. James chapter one, verse 19. So then my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I love that. I love how New King James says it. It says, be swift to hear. You know, it's like that runner that's just like expectant, that's ready. Okay, I want to be swift to hear the things that the body of Christ is speaking to me so that I can grow, so that I can mature. I'm going to close my mouth and listen. I'm going to be slow to speak so that I can mature and I can learn to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Got it? Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us how to walk. First step today, Lord. We're grateful for it. And Lord, I, I just... I, I just pray for our body that we would be a truth-telling body and that we do it in love. Um, guys, I have to warn you, you are going to have opportunities this week, most likely today, where you're going to have to do some truth-telling. I, I, I know I'm, every time I preach on something, I then face it the next week. <laughs> and I know the Lord's going to give us opportunities. Those are on purpose and it's a way for you to grow, and it's a way for our body to grow. So Lord, we just welcome those things and pray for the grace to, to maneuver through them well so that we can have deeper relationships, so that we can grow in Christ, mature in Christ, so that ultimately we can fulfill the mission that you've called us to do. And we pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen.